Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Lindley Barbie, who will be speaking for us today. Dr. Barbie is uh, new to the faculty here at UW. Uh, she did her infectious disease fellowship training here, so we know her well, and she is assistant medical director for the STD program, and I will turn it over to Lindley. Well, I know that you have had um, talks on STDs in the past. I just wanted to do a case-based review of STDs in HIV primary care and go over a couple of cases that I've seen recently and how I think about those. So the first case is a 29-year-old man who has sex with men, uh, well known to me. He's stage one HIV, not on ARVs yet. He just is not really ready to take a pill once a day, but well controlled, CD4 count 930, viral load about 3,000. And he comes in for routine care and basically his two complaints that day are I like to get back on the Celexa because my, I'm a little moody again, and um, I'm having some acid reflux, can I get a PPI? So not, not much going on. His HIV history is he was diagnosed three years ago during acute infection because um, he had a known um, positive partner. He has had both primary and secondary syphilis. The last um, time was about a year and a half ago, and he had gonorrhea diagnosed about five months ago. Um, it was gonorrhea urethritis. On review of systems, everything else was negative. When I asked his social history, he said he had only one partner in the past 12 months and he presumed they were monogamous, but I think we have to assume otherwise given his recent gonorrhea diagnosis. He tops and bottoms. He says he uses condoms 100% of the time, including for oral sex. He's employed at a bathhouse. He um, used to be a butler. He uses some alcohol and marijuana, but no other bad habits. On physical exam, he looks really well. He's well appearing, he's got nothing going on really. Um, I did put up there his enlarged tonsils, but on previous exams and on subsequent exams, um, they're always about the same size. So I wanted to just talk through what, what would you do here? Obviously, I'm happy to give him back his Celexa and some Omeprazole. We'll assess his readiness to start ARVs, but what else would we do? So it's a talk on STDs, so routine STD screening at all exposed sites. So the current CDC guidelines um, for screening HIV positive MSM are that all men who are sexually active should have a urine nucleic acid amplification testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia if they report insertive anal or oral intercourse, rectal testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia if they report receptive anal intercourse, and um, pharyngeal testing with NAT for gonorrhea if they perform oral sex and a syphilis serology. And that's at least annually for all men. But some men deserve more frequent testing, those who are higher risk. So multiple partners, anonymous partners, patients or their sex partners who are using meth or poppers, those who've had a bacterial STD diagnosis in the prior 12 months, or those who report unprotected anal intercourse. So our patient does not have a lot of partners, is not using substances, but he had gonorrhea reported about five months ago. So that makes him high risk, and he should be screened as frequently as every three months. So he was last here on that date when he came in with the gonococcal urethritis, so he's due for routine screening. And since he tops and bottoms, um, we're gonna do all three sites, including a syphilis serology at that point. So he's well, we let him go, but two days later his results come back and he's got gonorrhea at the pharynx and at the rectum. So what do you do now? So we have to bring him back. Um, in, in August of 2012, the CDC updated their STD treatment guidelines and the preferred and basically only treatment available for this gentleman is ceftriaxone 250 milligrams intramuscularly plus a second agent. Um, and current guidelines say azithromycin or doxycycline. I actually will remove the doxycycline from this option. Um, there are three studies out currently that say that ceftriaxone and azithro is superior to ceftriaxone plus doxycycline, and the 2014 STD guidelines are going to remove doxy from um, this recommendation. Now, if this man um, was a heterosexual and did not have gonorrhea in his pharynx, there would be the option to still use suffixime 400 milligrams plus azithromycin. And you can still use suffixime plus azithromycin for expedited partner therapy with heterosexuals. So that is the practice of you diagnose your patient, perhaps a woman or 
you know, heterosexual man, and you give them a partner pack that has cefixime and azithromycin, which can, you can get at pharmacies, at least in Washington State. I know some of you are not in Washington State for the partner. The other thing I wanted to mention on this slide is that if your patient has ceph uh, ceftriaxone or a penicillin allergy, you can use azithromycin two grams um, given once together. Um, but if that's the case and the patient needs to come back for a test of cure, they say seven to 10 days, I would push it 10 to 14 days after treatment. Um, you can get some false positives in that seven to 10 day window if you're using nucleic acid amplification testing. So what else do we need to do when we diagnose one of our patients with um, a bacterial STD? All bacterial STDs are reportable to your local public health jurisdiction. I know you're in very a lot of different places right now, so I don't have um, how to do the reporting in each county, but here in King County, I provided the URL for that. And this is essentially the form that you'll see. So you put the patient's information on there, their diagnosis, you know, gonorrhea, chlamydia, where the, from what site it came from and what the treatment was and the treatment date. And then if you look at the bottom, I'm sorry this is really small, but there is a section for partner treatment, partner management, and this is key to public health control of STDs. So either you or public health can do the treatment of partners. Usually it's pretty easy if they come in with their partner to just treat them then and there. Otherwise, if they have multiple or anonymous partners, referring to public health is, is definitely an option. We're happy to do that for you. All persons um, diagnosed with an STD need to be rescreened in three months, which goes along with our, you know, rescreening guidelines for um, men who have bacterial STDs um, for the next year. So case one, um, we just talked about routine screening guidelines um, in HIV positive MSM at least annually and as frequently as every three months based on their risk status. Um, gonorrhea treatment currently is ceftriaxone and azithromycin. And then lastly, um, reporting to public health and ensuring sex partners are treated is a main priority for public health control. So this is a case, um, a guy I saw in clinic as urgent care. He's not my patient. He is a 38-year-old Latino, um, MSN, stage two, HIV, well-controlled, and he comes in with a new rash. He said he noticed this pink, pink dots on his arms for about three days. He didn't have any fevers, chills, or night sweats. When asked, he said, oh yeah, I have a couple of nodes in my neck. He had no upper respiratory infection symptoms, no sick contacts, um, didn't report any genital or rectal sores in the past couple of months. Um, and his last STD testing, including syphilis serology, was about six months ago. On further questioning, he is sexually active. He's had three partners in the past six months. Usually he bottoms, but he can be versatile as well. Um, he says he'd like to use condoms, but actually his partners don't really want to, um, but he discloses his status. And he occasionally drinks some alcohol, but he doesn't do any other bad habits. So on physical exam, uh, his vital signs are stable. He looks fairly well, except um, on palpation, he has a one by one centimeter lymph node in his left anterior cervical chain. And although he hadn't noticed it, he has this faint pink macular rash all over his trunk, his back, his arms. On examination of the palms and soles, he has a lesion on his right palm and um, several on his soles. His general exam was benign, as was his rectal exam with anoscopy. So I just want to show you a couple of pictures. Um, this is very reminiscent of what his rash looked like, very faint pink. It looks like a viral exanthem, pretty macular at this point. It was maybe even a little fainter than this. He had a couple lesions like this on his foot. And there's one kind of brown macular lesion in his palm. So he has secondary syphilis. And I just wanted to review a little bit of the presentation of secondary syphilis because although rash is the primary presentation that we think of, there are some other things we need to look out for as well. So the rash can span, it can be very different, macular, maculopapular, or even pustular, and I've seen some kind of an ulceral pustular as well. Lymphadenopathy is fairly common, either generalized or localized, and he had just kind of one lymph node. Systemic symptoms, fevers, malaise, anorexia, with or without a rash. Um, so sometimes in the right patient population, someone coming in with just some vague systemic symptoms, it's not unreasonable to check an RPR. Mucosal involvement is common, alopecia, 
pharyngitis and arthralgias with or without other symptoms. And I have seen one case of pharyngitis being the only presenting symptom um, that was missed by several providers um, until he came to infectious disease clinic. So just a couple of images of variations on the rash. This rash is a little bit more intense, a little bit more papular um, than the first rash we saw. Here are some images of alopecia, um, can, very patchy um, in non-specific pattern. I'm not sure in this one, this is mucus patch. You can kind of see these almost ulcerative kind of whitish lesions on her tongue. And then um, this one I know is a little disturbing, but this is condylomalata. So these wart-like lesions on the vulva that are non-painful at all, but are um, pretty extensive. So different lesions to think about with secondary syphilis. So just a quick management, what do we do with this patient? So clinically diagnosed with secondary syphilis based on his symptoms and kind of time frame from his last syphilis serology. At this point, because he is HIV positive and I don't have his RPR quantitative back, I did screen him for symptoms of neurosyphilis with just some basic quick questions about ringing in the ears, vision changes, uh, neuropathy-like symptoms. I ordered an RPR quantitative and I did STD testing at all um, other sites as well because so often STDs um, come together in pairs. If this patient was HIV negative, I would also do HIV testing. Here in King County, 14% of guys diagnosed with syphilis will be diagnosed with HIV at the same time as well. Also, the most important step is treating that day based on your symptoms, 2.4 million units of benzathine penicillin. Um, I think this is a pretty important point I've seen from the public health standpoint, many urgent cares and emergency rooms that will have syphilis on the differential for a rash and order the RPR, but not treat the patient um, empirically, and then we lose the patient and, and can't get that person treated. So you don't need to wait for the RPR to come back if you have the right clinical syndrome and setting. So follow-up, technically CDC guidelines are RPR quantitative for HIV positive men at 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, 12, and 24 months. Um, and you want to see a four-fold dilution, four-fold change, two dilutions in six months. So that's, you know, this guy ended up being 1 to 32, or 1 to 64. You want to see him come down to 1 to 16 um, by six months. Again, public health reporting is is key, um, as is sex partner treatment, and he's going to require STD screening every three months of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis for the next year. And that's all I have, I think, for today. I'll take any questions.